A very good afternoon, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today at the ISIS ASIC seminar on After Ukraine and Taiwan, India's New Balancing Act. This event aims to assess New Delhi's difficulties in preserving the traditional security partnership with Moscow <coughs> and limiting the conflict with Beijing amidst India's expanding strategic cooperation with the United States and the deepening collaboration between Russia and China. We are delighted to have with us as a guest speaker, Professor C. Raja Mohan, Visiting Research Professor, Institute of South Asian Studies at NUS, and Senior Fellow, Asia Society Policy Institute, <coughs> sorry, New Delhi. Today's session is live streamed on ISA's Facebook page. I now invite ISA's Director, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Sevia to deliver the opening remarks and chair the interactive section with Prof. Mohan. Professor Sevia, please. Thank you, Kuntavi. Good afternoon, Professor C. Raja Mohan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of ISS, I would like to thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel session entitled After Ukraine and Taiwan, India, India's New Balancing Act. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the recent, recent crisis in the Taiwan Strait are having important implications on the global order. If nothing else, everyone and their aunties and uncles now seem familiar with the terms supply chain resilience and strategic ambiguity. While they may not have initiated the global shifts that we are witnessing, they've certainly brought to the fore specific conundrums and hastened the need for strategic calculations. For India, the war in Ukraine has given rise to complex choices, strategic balancing, and public positioning vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the United States, and the EU, among others. Meanwhile, the crisis over Taiwan has accentuated India's concerns over China's posturing in the Indo-Pacific. Together, these two crises also point towards a deepening of Russia's partnership with China, or perhaps I should say reliance on China, and this poses a further challenge for India. Broader questions and complexities also have also emerged over India's position in Central Asia and Eurasia. However, the shifting global order may also present opportunities for India. Indeed, the focus on the Indo-Pacific is particularly important as India in, is pivotal in so many ways to this new regionalization. The emergence of minilateral institutions may also present opportunities for India to form interest-based alliances and relations and also balance existing power equations. To help us think through these issues and many more, I'm delighted to welcome back to ISS Professor C. Raja Mohan. Professor Mohan is a familiar face amongst us, and many of us know him and um, have a lot of uh, respect for his work. As we all know, he's an internationally acclaimed strategic thinker and a leading commentator on India's foreign policy. Um, I won't say too much more. I'd like to pass the floor over, because like all of you, I'm also looking forward to hearing Professor Mohan's thoughts and to the discussion thereafter. So without further ado. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back at ISAS uh, among our friends and uh, colleagues uh, here. Uh, as uh, Dr. Iqbal said, uh, we really, these two crises, the twin crises, uh, if you will, uh, in Ukraine and th in Taiwan, are not merely uh, regional crises of a specific kind, but I think the global consequences uh, are today far more significant. In a, in a way, uh, not since the Second World War. I mean, have we seen a direct confrontation of the kind that we're seeing today between the major powers? Because we had many wars uh, after the Second World War uh, in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle, not in Europe, in Middle East. But none of them involved a direct confrontation uh, between, the, between the great powers. Uh, so for the first time, we're really seeing a much more direct conflict between uh, US and Russia, uh, Russia and the West uh, in the heart of Europe, uh, as well as between China and the US uh, in, the, in the Taiwan Straits. And this in turn, I mean, in, in, uh, in the Taiwan crisis, not just uh, US, uh, Japan is deeply concerned uh, about what's going on there. So in some senses, uh, it's not just a question of China's uh, unification, but uh, the crisis there brings in the the Japanese uh, whose security will be fundamentally affected by uh, what happens in, in Taiwan. So in that sense, uh, these are really uh, major uh, consequences for this, for this, uh, for the two, two crises that are, one is actually a conflict, 
other is still a, still a, still a crisis. So what I thought I'll really uh, do is just that, just to first to stress a bit on, uh, on the hinge moment, if you will, uh, we're really at a hinge moment in world politics where the outcome of these two conflicts are not just, uh, you know, uh, just a question of who wins and who loses, but it has consequences for the order in Europe, certainly. I mean, uh, whatever the outcome is between uh, Russia and the West and Ukraine will have significant uh, impact on the, uh, on the regional security order and the global security order in Europe. And how the Taiwan crisis gets resolved will also have an impact on the uh, Asian security order, and, and that in turn, uh, the nature of the relationships uh, between, the, between the major powers. So if you look at the, the, the hinge moment, if you call it the hinge moment, at least three broad trends, I mean, you can clearly see. One, uh, the two conflicts uh, herald, as I said, uh, the return of the great power rivalry, uh, that for nearly 40 years, I mean, certainly since the end of the Cold War, uh, we'd not seen uh, great power conflict. And that is back now, and, and I think is, in a, is it in a sharp form. The second is the, uh, that the impact of this war on a globalized world that we've seen, uh, that the supply chains, the disruption of the global economy, that what seemed a conflict uh, in remote Europe, uh, it, as it turns out, I mean, the energy prices, uh, food prices, that uh, in a way, uh, not many of us are familiar with the fact that Ukraine and Russia are the bread balls for the, for the world, and that uh, what was happening there was going to have an effect of the kind uh, that was not foreseen. Well, well, we knew Russia was a major source of energy, uh, but a disruption of that uh, through sanctions has produced a, a dramatic effect. So the assumption that we made about a globalized world and its stability are fundamentally under question. And I think already uh, in the years before, uh, we've had uh, the uh, pressures on globalized world. I mean, I think the policies in the US uh, since Trump came, Brexit, and many other parts, uh, the questioning of globalization uh, in the West uh, has been rampant. But today, I think in China today, also under Xi Jinping, has questioned globalization. So now these two conflicts only accelerate, I think, uh, the trend towards uh, a rethinking, a reorganizing of the globalized economy. Uh, I don't think we're going to fully deglobalize, but how the nature of the supply chains, the nature of uh, interdependencies are going to be worked out. Uh, the emphasis on trusted uh, partners, the emphasis on creating uh, like-minded coalitions to deal with the economic challenges, that's going to be uh, a major one as well. The third is the, the technological disruption. I mean, that uh, uh, we've seen the, the digital revolution, other scientific revolutions, which uh, uh, if you go back to the old uh, Marxist days, I mean, uh, the forces of production, if you will, I mean, fundamentally changing, I mean, and it happens uh, every other century. I mean, that, that you have actually a dramatic change in the nature of the uh, uh, you know, production, economic production through technological means, and uh, a change in the nature of the forces of production. Uh, at least the Marxists used to say, will change the nature of the relations of production, uh, that it's not just within societies, uh, but also uh, across societies. That means the nature of the relationships uh, between the major economic entities would also change uh, depending on how uh, they adapt to the uh, to the disruption so i think these three trends that were already visible i mean have become sharper uh, with the uh, with the with the crisis in uh, in these two crises uh, what i thought i'll do in the next uh, few minutes is really to to analyze india's response to this these crises at uh, three three broad levels i mean um, one is the the specifics of how India has responded to the two crises. I mean, that's, that's one part. Second, what does this imply for India's uh, great power relationships? How does it India, is there going to be a major change in the way uh, India is going to deal with the, uh, with the, other, with the major powers in the, in the days ahead? And does this mean something more fundamental, more consequential for uh, the framework of India's foreign policy? That, that is there a, uh, a reorientation uh, of uh, India's foreign policy that will come out of this, given the structural change in the international system. Uh, we constantly hear references to you know, non-alignment, multi-alignment, uh, uh, those kind of arguments. I mean, so where does that, are they really helpful in understanding what India is doing at this juncture? Or do we need a new vocabulary, a new framework to, to understand where uh, India is going to be uh, in, uh, once this conflict uh, come, to, come to an end? 
So on the, the two crises itself, I mean, um, uh, the Ukraine crisis, uh, I think, only reminds us of uh, India's difficulty dealing with uh, military crisis involving Russia, I mean, before that Soviet Union, that uh, we've had, given the nature of the strategic partnership that evolved between India and uh, Soviet Union uh, in the 50s, uh, Soviet support for India and Kashmir uh, in the, the UN Security Council, uh, and the Anglo-American alliance with Pakistan meant that a certain reliance on the Soviet uh, support on the, to fend off the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-American intervention uh, in, uh, in, in Kashmir. So therefore, uh, every time a crisis where Russia was involved, or Soviet Russia was involved, uh, India's ambivalence was, you know, couldn't be hidden. I mean, uh, that if you go back to Nehru, the thundering response to Suez crisis, uh, and the torture that Delhi went through in uh, dealing with the Hungarian invasion, which took place roughly at the same time. I mean, it's not that countries are saints and they have to be even-handed or they have to be consistent, but the fact is uh, that uh, 56 posed the problem that your anti-imperialism, your anti-Western thing, it was easy to stand up with NASA, but but moment mm -hmm. Russia intervened in Hungary, uh, that you had a you had a problem of how do you deal with it? Uh, do we, how far do you go? Uh, but what's interesting is there was a bigger debate in '56 in the Indian Parliament by the because at the time the, the leaders of the opposition and within the Congress were tall figures and, and a lot of people raised questions about uh, how do you think about Russia's intervention? Uh, but today, of course, there's far little debate. <laughs> in a way, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, uh, while the government might have a policy debates within the public discourse, uh, there's not been as much. Uh, what does this mean for, um, because especially uh, because in Ukraine, I mean, I think it tests many of the fundamental assumptions I mean, of India's emphasis on sovereignty, non-use of force to, to change borders. Uh, there are issues not abstract. I mean, these are issues of direct relevance for India in Kashmir, in the line of control, uh, in, in the China border. Uh, so therefore, uh, when Russia actually violates these principles, uh, that the debate has been one of uh, hesitation or even articulate this. In fact, if you see the public discourse, uh, quite a large number was quite willing to believe the Russian argument. This is all because of NATO expansion. Russia was provoked into this expansion. But you don't need a complex genius to see, look, a country invading another country and claiming that it has no right to exist. Uh, so I think Putin was making a certain set of arguments. It did need NATO. Uh, to uh, to justify his invasion, but, but I think, but the way the you know, it's not just India. I mean, even the Pope uh, believes that it was uh, NATO expansion that created the invasion. So it's it's a widespread argument. But but for in the Indian case, the public discourse has been very different. And as I said, we've had this problem because Russia is our friend. Therefore, how you deal with Russia's actions? Uh, Fifty six we mentioned. Sixty eight. Uh, Czechoslovakia, Russian intervention in Czechoslovakia. Again, there was a there was a problem. This time, it was Indira Gandhi who had to deal with it. Uh, there was a lot of ambivalence. Uh, even then, I think 68, there was a bigger debate. And then 79, it was much closer, the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, where again, uh, that time it was the Janta Party, uh, Janta government, in, opposition government in power. Uh, they struggled, and Indira Gandhi came, and you know there was. Uh, an attempt to engage the Russians. So we didn't endorse the uh, invasion. We did not criticize it uh, in public either. And so therefore, you had uh, a large, there were costs to pay uh, with the uh, Islamic world, with a whole range of countries who believed uh, that India's position was unacceptable. Uh, but you know, Indian argument was, the, look, they were criticizing it in private. They told Brezhnev that this is not acceptable. But in any case, the public level criticism was, uh, was not uh, possible. Again, it was a height of the Cold War. So in the Ukraine crisis, I mean, I think what you saw was really uh, a reluctance to criticize and uh, in a public that was really quite empathetic to the Russian arguments, uh, while uh, the elite, I mean, I'm not talking about the mass public, but of the, of the elite level opinion. But I think as the crisis unfolded, uh, India had to adapt. Because there's no government which can simply say, it's not just about deciding who's right or who's wrong, but of actually saying, what are the consequences? Because in the beginning, it looked like, uh, you know, if the Americans themselves were saying, uh, they predicted the invasion correctly, 
but they said to last four days. So if Russia was going to win in four days, I mean, it didn't make sense to criticize, I presume, I mean, in a pragmatic sense, uh, that if new facts were going to be created on the ground, you, you deal with that. But the fact is, now, seven months later, we are nowhere near the resolution. And you've seen a progressive adaptation incrementally on the Indian position in the various uh, United Nations Security Council votes, where India was a member, uh, into emphasizing sovereignty, integrity, uh, UN Charter, UN principles, uh, which call for respect for sovereignty. Uh, and in Samarkand, finally, we saw the Indian Prime Minister publicly, uh, you know, uh, criticize, uh, not criticize, I mean, mention, the look, I mean, raising questions about the about the war, uh, which has got widespread, widespread pickup. So I think there is adaptation because the conditions produced by this war uh, have, have affected us uh, fundamentally, and therefore the question of how you deal with it, uh, it can't be just uh, you merely not in a position to uh, to support uh, whatever Russia does, in spite of our special relationship with Russia. I'll come back to that a uh, little more detail, but but you had to adapt to the ground level uh, situation. Uh, the uh, in the Taiwanese case, I think uh, India has largely stayed out of the East Asian crises and disputes, and barring the initial India's participation in the 50s uh, in the Indochina uh, peace issues, and later the Korean, you know, initially in the Korean peace issue and later the Indochina peace issues, largely stayed out of the uh, East Asian conflicts, uh, especially those that involved China. And in Taiwan in particular, uh, because India was took such a strong position on the uh, question of, uh, you know, one China right in the beginning, uh, that uh, India would not engage with Taiwan well into the early 90s uh, on the ground that uh, we don't really, we, are, we really believe in one China policy, though most countries actually, including Southeast Asians, today who are very close to China but also engaged with Taiwan, but India's policy, it's only after the 90s, there was a bit of engagement of uh, dealing with the region, uh, dealing with Taiwan. Uh, there's a lot of economic engagement today, uh, but the Taiwanese, of course, expect a lot more Indian political support, uh, but the Indians uh, focus more on the economic side. But, but there is a level of engagement uh, which has not been uh, seen before. And when the crisis happened, when India did issue a statement uh, where it mentioned uh, opposing unilateral actions by by the Chinese. Uh, we wouldn't have said this probably a few years ago, but the fact that the Chinese advise us, advise India, avoid unilateral actions in Kashmir, uh, because the Chinese took up the Kashmir question to the UN Security Council uh, at the behest of Pakistan. And here I think basically India was repeating that argument, but, but this was the first time India is actually uh, critical of uh, the Chinese approach in, in indirectly. And the Taiwanese were quite thankful. I mean, in fact, they mentioned India in the 50-odd countries that they thanked uh, for taking a position on, on Taiwan crisis, probably for the, for the first time. And this, of course, uh, is directly tied to the nature of the India-China relationship uh, at this point. And, and we, will, we will come to that uh, when we discuss the, 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 the next section. So, so I think uh, to looking at these re two regional crises, I think, uh, because these are going to test quite a bit of India's traditional policies. And we're beginning to see that if these are going to be as consequential uh, as we argued at the beginning, then uh, India will have to adapt. India will have to respond this, uh, to these two crises in a far more uh, substantive manner than, than it has so far. And I think we're beginning to see some of that. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. To the, come to the second uh, aspect of uh, India's policy in this, uh, the question of its uh, relationships with the three major powers that is uh, who are involved in this that is Russia China and the and the, and the US with Russia as we said uh, that one reason why India's silence on uh, on the question of uh, Ukraine in the beginning and even now I mean we still don't directly criticize uh, the Russian uh, Russian aggression we don't even use the word aggression or uh, invasion uh, it's a crisis in Ukraine, but not uh, a war in Ukraine. Uh, so you know how diplomats uh, use language. But but the fact is uh, that uh, the there are certain factors that explain this and why India has been ambivalent or ambiguous. Uh, one, India's dependence on Russian weapons is well known. I mean, uh, you know, maybe Dr. Joshi will hear no in more detail in terms of the dependence. I mean, seventy percent or. But the fact is, though India is buying a lot more weapons from other countries in recent years, the overall inventory is still dependent quite a bit on the Russian weapons. Much of the Air Force, much of the Army, uh, 
a significant, significant part of the Navy. I mean, the, the, the legacy uh, equipment, which adds up to a huge amount of the inventory, still depends on the, uh, on, the, on the Russian weapons. So, and it was not just a question of dependence, therefore, what position do you take? Uh, the invasion came at a time when India was locked in a conflict with China, where uh, Russian troops uh, on, the, on the border were still in the process of resolving that issue. So I think the timing of it means uh, that uh, you're not going to do anything that disturbs your main source of, uh, the main pipeline of weapons that we badly need to deal with the, with the, with the, Russian, with the, with the Chinese threat uh, on, the, on the border. Uh, and then there is the, uh, the you know, special nuclear relationship with Russia, on the, especially uh, in relation to nuclear submarines, uh, underwater uh, deterrent part of India's uh, you know, nuclear, nuclear uh, strategy. So that was a, a second thing. And the third element, which for India has always been important, was that Russia is a balancer in the great power system, that Russia would uh, you know, prevent the domination of the region by China. And in fact, India-Russia relationship solidified not just because of the US factor or the Anglo-American intervention in Kashmir, but also the India's problems with China in the 60s. And in fact, the deepening of the Sino-Indo-Russian relationship uh, took place when Sino-Russian relation, Sino -Russian relationship uh, uh, went, went, uh, was, in a, was in a difficult, difficult period. So I think the, the reliance on Russia as a special critical partner, uh, I think, continues to weigh on, on uh, on, uh, on the Indian on the Indian policy, and therefore uh, the the uh, avoiding anything that would disrupt that relationship has been one of the core principles of India's uh, India's foreign policy. But it still has to deal with uh, a the relative economic decline of Russia's uh, you know Russia's position in India's overall calculus, uh, because trade with Russia remains very low. Uh, commercial ties are pretty small. Uh, and the trade with India, India's trade with China is close to $150 billion, if you include Hong Kong, and similarly with, uh, with the US, uh, with Russia is still around 10 to $12 billion. I mean, even with the oil purchases. So it's not a great economic relationship. So in a, it, there is an imbalance uh, that, is, that is beginning to creep up, and that whether this will have long-term effect or not, we could talk about uh, later uh, uh, when, we, when we discuss the, the larger issues. Then the question of China, of course, uh, uh, for us, for India, what is the significant change that has taken place in the last few years has been the growing uh, threat from China. Uh, it's four military crises, uh, 2013, uh, 2014, 2017, and 2020, have created a condition where you have to deal with the Chinese power on the border, where China's military strength, its, you know, you know, its political uh, uh, way today in the international system and dealing with the Chinese power uh, has become a major, major challenge. Uh, and uh, given this, how India dealt with the Taiwan crisis, I mean, that you don't, one level, you don't want to add a new problem to the already bad relationship. That a lot of people ask India, why aren't you being more forthcoming on Taiwan? But we have enough problems. We have the boundary issue, we have the Kashmir issue, we have the Pakistan issue, we have Sri Lanka. So you have enough problems to talk to the Chinese. Uh, do you burden it with another aspect? That is the, at least the, the, the mainline answer that you don't want to uh, weigh down by having uh, another, adding another, another issue to the, to the problem. But there's also the other aspect, that, that uh, an element that has come in the last eight years under the present government, uh, quite early on when uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited India, uh, 2014, right after Modi government took charge. Uh, Shushma Swaraj, then the foreign minister, uh, told uh, Wangi that, look, uh, we support one China, and we expect you to support one India. Uh, it's not that I don't know if it made enough impression on Mr. Modi, but that's a, that's a conviction in the ruling party that, that Chinese don't reciprocate. That while India has been more than consistent in support to one China policy, uh, you don't f feel, get the same sense from, from the Chinese. So, uh, there are people in India who argue, or oh, play the Taiwan card, play the, you know, be more explicit, do more political engagement. So it is still a cautious engagement with Taiwan. I mean, we do even less than what Southeast Asia does with, uh, with, uh, with Taiwan. Uh, but there is an expansion of the economic side. But on the political side, India is still not ready to, to add that uh, additional factor 
uh, to the uh, to the to the dispute. The the, the third uh, element of the great power relationships, of course, is the U.S. relationship. Uh, as things have gotten worse with with uh, with China, uh, that India's turn to the U.S. is now fairly easily correlated. That is certainly after the second uh, third crisis, 2017 Doklam crisis, where we saw India revive, join the revival of the Quad. Uh, expand the engagement with the United States, uh, security partnerships uh, with the U.S. So you're seeing, actually, as the China challenge became more dominant uh, in the Indian calculus, the security strategic partnership with the U.S. has become that much more that much more important. And uh, after 2020, we've seen even more intensification uh, of the of the India's relationship with the U.S. And it also coincided, I would say, in the last. Uh, since 2017, the deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship, starting under the Trump administration, and more have gotten worse under the Biden administration. So, so therefore, uh, there's a simultaneity to it uh, that, that this has helped push the, the two sides quite close uh, together. So therefore, what you have today is a much more a deeper uh, partnership between uh, India and the U.S., uh, which India is doing things with the U.S., which it would have never done before. I mean, in terms of uh, this intensity of exercises, uh, in terms of political support, uh, in the in the Indo, not only in the Indo-Pacific, we are with them in the in the Middle East. For a long time, we kept our substantive distance from the Americans in the Middle East, but today, we are partners with them in the West Asian Quad. So I think the way India thinks about the re you know with the U.S. and its relationship has uh, dramatically grown. And within this, uh, the uh, the other factors, of course, as I said, trade, uh, U.S. trade with uh, U.S. If you put services and uh, uh, goods, it's it's more than it's about 160 billion dollars, and it's growing the fastest. Uh, unlike the China trade, India's trade with the U.S. Uh, it's a surplus on the, for the Indians. So there is, it's a it's a much more forward-looking, positive relationship. While with China, it is a limited export of natural resources and import of most industrial commodities uh, with, uh, with China. And then you have the diaspora, which is now more than 4 million in the US, which uh, forms a very, very important um, uh, bridge between India and the US. So the, the comprehensive nature of the India-US relationship uh, is today stands out uh, far more visibly than with any other, uh, with any other power. Uh, so that, I think, has changed the relative equations. And the US has been willing to cut a lot of slack for India. While you had all the media attacking India, weakest link of the Quad, uh, why is India buying Russian oil, why is India supporting Russia, not criticizing Russia, the administration has been quite measured and often explaining to, to the American audiences why it is taking a soft-handed soft, soft -handed approach to India, saying, look, we are in the long game of re-engaging India. Uh, that India's importance for <coughs> Indo-Pacific and the larger global uh, strategy of the United States. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think India has benefited quite significantly. I mean, if you uh, take a, uh, a measure of who has come out better in the, in the seven months of the Ukraine crisis, and U.S. is looking pretty good in, in a way uh, with the Russia on the defensive, uh, China also on the defensive, uh, you have India largely uh, coming unscathed and being valued uh, even for the little support it gives uh, for, the, for, the, for the West. So therefore, I think there you've seen uh, India-US uh, relationship uh, has become uh, a, a solid anchor in, uh, in, in India's uh, major power relationship. But India's reluctance to criticize Russia has been uh, widely you know, said, is India returning to non-alignment? I mean, is this? Uh, is India now back to being equidistant from the major powers? But my own view is no, it's not a return to non-alignment. Uh, but it is actually uh, a, a more interest-based, careful calculation of the policy rather than uh, just because what does India says on Ukraine or not does not change the weight of the U.S., the economic weight of the U.S. in its relationship or the nature of the security partnership with the U.S. and the larger global and regional uh, uh, engagement that India does with the with, uh, with Ukraine. And, and the idea that India's uh, unwillingness to support the West on Ukraine would undermine India's relationship with the West. 
That's again proven to be wrong. Actually, as I said, the U.S. has been more than willing to accommodate uh, India's sensitivities, and and it has uh, it has worked. So I think we need to think about this. This let's we'll conclude with that. Uh, but uh, but we need to. Uh, so what is this? I mean, uh, is it non-alignment, multi-alignment, or all alignment? Uh, but that question, I think, we'll, we'll take it up at the, at the, at the end. Uh, but at this point, I mean, I would say that brings me to the third set of issues, which is really the reorientation of India's uh, foreign policy. Uh, that when we talked about non-alignment in the past, I mean, it's, it's really uh, between Russia and the U.S., this, the two superpowers, India was at some distance from both. That is, Russia was not India's neighbor. So you could take a position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the U.S. has two major powers uh, in which you could you could deal with it. But today, if it is a conflict between China and the U.S., China is India's neighbor. So in a way, China directly affects India in a way that, uh, and we have conflicts with China. Therefore, this is not something India can be neutral between U.S. and China. Uh, that it, 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 given its own conflict with China, I mean that it, it is not going to be neutral and that it's, it has to deal with it. And some people in India say that, look, it's because you got too close to the Americans that the Chinese are hostile to you. And the other argument is, it is because China is hostile to you, you're getting closer to the United States. But the fact is, uh, there is a superpower on India's neighborhood, uh, and that is China, and its relationship with India's neighbors is growing. Therefore, does India balance it or not is the question, not whether you are non-aligned or not. How does India deal with Chinese power is the principal question, and that requires uh, a partnership with the US and the West. So, so, but, but the, but part of the problem is the way our foreign policy discourse from the beginning has been framed in alignment, non-alignment terms, which tells you nothing. But that is the dominant way our academics or our media uh, debate it, as if the central question is, are we non-aligned enough this morning? But the question is, look, who is threatening you? What are your threats? Uh, what are the, uh, who are your main trading partners? Uh, that was never taken, you know, all that was considered as something irrelevant, but it's only a question of uh, are you, are you non-aligned or not? I mean, but which meant really didn't tell you anything about India's policy. It doesn't tell you anything about India's regional policies. It didn't tell you anything of how India dealt with principal security threats in the past. After all, Nehru went to the United States in 62. Indira Gandhi turned to Soviet Union. We signed a security treaty with Soviet Union in 1971. Uh, so that is, how does that square with the discourse on non-alignment? Just because the politicians say we are non-aligned, or like Indira Gandhi said, I mean, there was a lot of criticism in the 70s, uh, Indo-Soviet treaty was not non-alignment. Uh, but, and there was in 77, uh, there was an election uh, where the opposition parties got together. If you go back to the manifesto, uh, we said genuine, we, we are going to be genuine non-aligned. Well, Indira Gandhi was pro-Soviet non-aligned. Uh, but but in the, Indira Gandhi said, look, whatever I do is non-alignment. <laughs> you can do what you want. What I do is non-alignment, which is ultimate justification that, that uh, whatever I do, uh, the state reasons, that is non-alignment. Because you defined a priori your policy as non-alignment. But, but I think it's, it's really been a red herring for those of us who study India's foreign policy and doesn't really explain to you anything at all of India's foreign policy behavior, but constantly obfuscates, you know, confuses the whole discourse rather than explains uh, India's, uh, India's uh, behavior. The, the second uh, aspect, I think, uh, India's relative position in the international system is growing. That if India you know, moves from today's at $3.5 trillion, I mean, if it gets to $6 trillion, $7 trillion by 2030, you're talking about India as the third largest economy. Uh, uh, it will overtake, it's all overtaken Britain, it will overtake uh, Germany and Japan in the few years. So it will be the third largest economy in, in the nominal terms. Uh, then are you still about talking about non-alignment? Are you going to think like a pole in the international affairs? Uh, so there, I think we're too premature to India think of itself as a pole because you don't have the strength because you'll be a distant third. You still have to navigate between the other two powers. But, but the fact is that the framing of the non-alignment as a weak developing country navigating between the major powers, uh, which was the discourse in the 50s, uh, actually becomes, if you're the top three economies, uh, top, third largest defense spender, third largest armed forces, then I think how India thinks of uh, its uh, foreign policy will be, will be very, 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 very different. 
Uh, and then the the uh, the role of the Indian diaspora, which is which is again, partly for this government, uh, Modi government, the diaspora has been a major issue. But I think we none of us have really, because you know, ISAS has a special uh, focus on diaspora issues in the past. Uh, but if you look at Indian diaspora today, I mean, I think it's where is it where is it concentrated? I mean, one the Gulf, which is a expatriate labor that is there. Uh, other outside of that, the Indian migration has largely been to the English-speaking world. That it is in the five, you know, US, UK, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, where the largest groups and and within these societies, you see Indian communities uh, becoming quite significant, influential. Uh, into political positions. So the nature of the linkage with the with the West, and the, particularly the Anglo-Saxon West, uh, for all the ranting about colonialism, I mean, your main diaspora outside is still uh, with these countries. And I think that nature of that relation to the diaspora is going to make significant changes to the way India deals with your former colonial power and the, in the empire, if you will, uh, in, a, in, a, in a general sense. So I think these are fundamentally changing the way uh, India uh, uh, behaves in the world. And I think we need to think through how do we capture this changing India and its relationships uh, internationally. Uh, that, I think, should be should be a major challenge for us as we look ahead. Uh, the coming decade in particular, I think, uh, of India's, uh, it's taken us 75 years to get to $3 trillion. It will take another 10 years to add another $3 trillion. So the scale of change of Indian economy, its dynamics of its trade, its relationship with the rest of the world is going to be much more rapid. And this, I think, in turn requires us to think about India. I mean, we do a lot on the India's domestic politics, but we also need to think how India relates with the other major economic entities, other major uh, political entities. I think this is going to be uh, clearly an exciting period in terms of uh, how we uh, deal with this, uh, the changes in the India's nature of India's position in the hierarchy within the international system and the nature of its relationships with the major powers, especially at a time when uh, there is a deep conflict between uh, US and Russia on the one side, uh, US, Russia and the West on one side, uh, as well as China and, 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 and the US uh, on, the, on the other. So this, I think, becomes a very, very important thing. I mean, the second uh, element is the, uh, the last few days, I mean, our foreign minister has been talking about uh, India as a, as a representative of the global south. Uh, that the that one of the things India has done in the last uh, six months is really to keep emphasizing the concerns of the other developing countries in relation to uh, the uh, the Ukraine crisis, the food uh, security, the uh, energy security, the inflation. So the range of issues that these are important and and that India is the one which is going to uh, give voice to these uh, these questions uh, on the debt question. Where uh, you have large, almost IMF says 57 countries are going to, you know, uh, under a, under a problem of uh, debt uh, burden. So therefore, it is now how do we think about this issue? Is India going back to the 1950s uh, of uh, champion of the of the non-aligned developing countries G77, or do you see a rising India actually leveraging its historic equities uh, within the developing world? Much as China keeps talking we are a developing country, but China has largely used the developing country argument to build political and economic relationships with the so-called global south. My sense is what India is doing is something closer to that, rather than a, a new trade union leader uh, of, the, of the global south. Uh, that countries of the developing world are looking for partners, and they don't want of the kind things we did in the, in the 50s, OK whether it's anti-apartheid movement or decolonization. It's not the political slogans. I mean, they want concrete support. So much of the praise for India was in India's capacity to deliver vaccines, India's capacity to give other assistance to the developing world. So this is not a return to the 50s, but, but one where actually uh, India's capabilities can be deployed uh, to create new, intense, uh, new and more intense relationships with the large uh, parts of the developing world. But then you're going to hear a lot of this phrase of global south. India is a new leader of the global south. So this is going to add one layer, one more layer of confusion to the uh, to the arguments about non-alignment, because non-alignment always always had two dimensions. One was the great power dynamic, and second was the north-south dimension. I mean, both elements were there. Uh, but today, 
uh, India is closer to the West than ever before. So this is not framing it as standing up to the West. Uh, that we're not, India is close to the West, but it's not a Japan to the US. It's not a Britain to the US. It's not a Australia to the US. It is an independent actor that is in partnership with the West, with the US. So I think that differentiation must be kept in mind. India is not a treaty ally, and it's not that the Americans are offering India a treaty uh, alliance either. Uh, so, but the, but the framing of it, the temptation for the discourse would be to keep going back to the non-aligned framework or to the Global South framework. But I think this is uh, far more uh, a sophisticated position. Uh, and I think the closest example is what we get to see from the China itself. I mean, the China, how China used the argument of being a, a developing country uh, and as a friend of the developing world against the dominance of the other powers. So I think it's more of an instrumental way of enhancing your position uh, in the rest of the world. And in some places, we're doing it in partnership with the US. The vaccine production uh, couldn't have been done without the US uh, and British help at that point of time. I mean, uh, the partnership with, the, with these two countries. Uh, nor does the uh, new areas where we want to work. So our partnership with the West will be a way of enhancing India's position in the developing world. And at the same time, uh, an India that is strong equities in the developing world would be a more valuable partner for, for the US. Having one more guy who stands behind the US and waves a flag, I mean, they have enough of those. Uh, I don't think they need another you know, person waving the Western flag behind them. But, but having an India that's capable of delivering diplomatic political uh, outcomes uh, will be far more valuable. So, so I think, so we got again to think about this in a, in a much more uh, complex, and, complex and sophisticated manner. But my question to you is, as we go ahead, how do we develop a new vocabulary? What is, is are we going to stuck with the alignment vocabulary, uh, strategic autonomy vocabulary? Because, uh, I mean, I've always been a critic of the strategic autonomy argument because every country tries to be strategically autonomous. We've seen that uh, every small country wants to increase its uh, room for maneuver within the circumstances that it finds itself. Well. It's not some unique Indian property. Uh, you look at uh, Turkey today, I mean, it's uh, a member of NATO supplying arms to Ukraine, uh, negotiating with Russia on, uh, on the grain deal, uh, speaking openly, saying that, look, Russia should return Crimea to, to, to Ukraine. So I think it's, people do things, you know, it's not that uh, it's constantly saying I'm strategically autonomous uh, means nothing. I mean, like Pakistan, for example, I mean, was an ally of the U.S., friend of China. Uh, it has managed complex relationships. So it's so I think this simply saying strategic autonomy, non-alignment, are not going to explain India's imperatives or India's engagement uh, with the world. And I think that's where uh, we need those of us who do foreign policy. We we'll have to. Because there's too much of this public discourse, which is kind of weighs, you know, is, has a weight of its own, which is important. But the academic discourse too is strapped into looking at India through this lens. But a, 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 most studies rooted in India's empirics uh, of actually, you know, looking at its behavior through periods, uh, you know, through historic periods, and focusing on and into. Distilling this into a, can we come up with new ideas and way of framing India's foreign policy as a rising power trying to build on its equities rather than an India that is wedded to non alignment uh, in, under new conditions. So I'll, I'll stop here, but I'd love to hear uh, what you all have to say. Thank you, Brahmoon, for that um, rich and textured discussion. You've thrown up um, a number of things for us to chew on and um, discuss and debate. Um, and I, I appreciate the way you, you, your, 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 your talk was grounded historically, but yet scanning the horizons for future strategic choices as well. And um, before I open the floor, maybe I'll just, I have, a, I have a number of things I wanted to ask, but I'm going to start, start with one first before I, before I open the floor. I, I, you know, the, your question about the need for new vocabulary, new paradigms, etc. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of perhaps India's uh, geoeconomic framing of its its uh, future and her positioning as well, and in that sense, you know, on one hand, the both the Ukraine crisis and, and potentially the the, um, the Ukraine invasion, let's put it that way, 
and the crisis in the Taiwan Strait have. Um, I, I wonder if it's actually questioned the paradigm of economic integration in Asia that, that everybody was talking about. That was the way <coughs> India was supposed to go as well. Um, but this is, I'm also thinking at the same time of vocabulary, and, and you mentioned the um, uh, Foreign Minister Jashankar's uh, comments. Um, fairly recently, he's on a number of occasions mentioned the concept of decentralized globalization. Um, could you explain yeah. what decentralized globalization yeah. actually means and how that fits with this vision of yeah. economic integration? No, I think, I think you touch upon one of the core aspects, and I think um, the, in the end, economics is a central element of uh, driving foreign policy. And even for the Nairobian period, uh, the choice made in favor of a particular domestic economic model had an impact on how it, you know, fitted in with the foreign policy that it chose uh, of, uh, you know, of distancing from the U.S., of an import substitution model, uh, and working with the Soviet Union uh, to build its core capacities. So I think it's always been a central one. And, and I think today, uh, the last 40 years, last 30 years, India's late globalization changed the paradigm under which uh, it, uh, it operated and created conditions for much greater uh, interaction with the with the U.S., China, the, and the West, and where Russia has actually fallen off in that map, as because Russia was no longer a, a economic actor in its own right, while India's engagement with China, with the U.S., with the Gulf, because of oil, etc., uh, dramatically increased. Uh, so I think the change in the economic orientation uh, altered the uh, structure. But I think the question that you raise about uh, peace in Asia, for example, that we taken for granted uh, peace in Europe forever, uh, and that the Europeans were so pleased with themselves. I mean, they always used to tell ASEAN, I remember those of you, the unending lectures about EU's example for uh, for ASEAN. I mean, but the fact is today, they're in the middle of a war. I mean, I don't think a generation of three generations of Europeans have grown up imagining what's happening today in the heart of Europe. There were problems in Balkans, there were other crises, but this is right in the heart of uh, heart of Europe, uh, which which is a, and we're talking about use of nuclear weapons, something that we didn't even think of in the Cold War, at the height of the Cold War. I mean, Russia and US still had a, had a means of engagement, and measures of controlling that conflict. But today, uh, you know, in the next few weeks, uh, this week he'll announce the annexation of uh, these provinces. Ukrainians are continuing to advance on the ground. So I think the, someone is going to be tested. I mean, uh, what is the meaning of this? And in Asia, again, for the last 30 years, we said the US-China rapprochement, uh, fixing of the Taiwan issue, I mean, finishing of the Taiwan issue, saw 40 years of peace and prosperity in this region, where everyone benefited from economic integration. Uh, but today, uh, that issue uh, is being, once again, being raised, not just war in Taiwan, but the question of whether Asian globalization can be sustained in the context of uh, the nature of the Chinese economic model and the, its relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the US and, uh, and Japan and the others. But I think what uh, decentered globalization, I think what um, Mr. Jayashankar seems to be talking about is really that the uncritical globalization between 91 to 2014, that phase is over. That India's, uh, you know, in fact, uh, in retrospect, I hope somebody does the work on uh, 2014 onwards, one of the first things Modi government did was question the value of free trade agreements. They really suspended most of the FTAs. And uh, were uncomfortable, though they entered the negotiations on RCEP, they were not very clear. And the decision to walk out of the RCEP uh, in 2019 reflected the, the sensibility that opening up of Indian economy to uncritical globalization has uh, hollowed out Indian manufacturing. Therefore, India needs a, a different approach. So. I think uh, what the foreign minister of India offering is a is a way of, and it's an explanation to India's new strategy, which is globalization is going to be tempered because of the way China has weaponized it, uh, because the nature of the U.S.-China conflict, and for India, uh, the strategy of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat or some measure of self-reliance in manufacturing sector becomes key. And this is not just abstract talk. I mean, the whole focus on the production-linked incentives the need to bring back manufacturing to India, uh, that has become the priority. So, so he's basically saying uh, you this is no longer the period of 91 to 2014, that this is a period where we, it doesn't mean we deglobalize. This is not going back to the Indira Gandhi period, but one in which you are far more measured 
in terms of how you do. You're going to negotiate free trade agreements with UAE, with Australia, with UK. But this is not simply saying all manufacturing will be outsourced to China. Uh, so I think that is the change, where you're tempering the past experience, uh, on the basis of the past experience of globalization, more domestic manufacturing, more production in India. Uh, and unlike in the Indira Gandhi period, I mean, what you see is really unleashing the domestic capital uh, to whether it's privatization of Air India or whether it is the kind of uh, infrastructure uh, projects that are going on and, and like under Adani and Ambani, uh, to uh, one where you foreign capital is welcome to produce in India. Well, the Indira Gandhi phase one is foreign capital was not welcome, domestic capital will be regulated and the state enterprises will do everything. So, so it's a new model, a model that actually strengthens the domestic capital and in partnership with the foreign capital to, to create domestic capabilities, at least that's it. So I think he's trying to put that in perspective by saying that, look, don't expect us to simply, you know, sign on to free trade agreements, uh, because there are issues within this, but, uh, but at least there's a different approach, and I think that's what he's uh, explaining here. Well, the floor is open for questions, um, and if you want to actually take up some of the questions that actually uh, Prof. Raja actually posed to you also, the floor is open. I know many of us are familiar with, our, with each other. Mm. We've been in the forums together. But if I could just ask you to just briefly introduce yourself before you ask your question. There's a roving mic just behind you. Is there? Right there. there. Yeah. Just put it in the yeah. Oh, him. Oh. Yeah. oh, you need mic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We, we are uh, live streaming, so everybody my, can My name you, is yeah. Punendra Jain. I have just come to ISIS uh, as um, a visiting fellow here for two months. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Raja Mohan. Enjoyed your presentation. I have just wanted to ask you a question about, you know, in the last 20 years, if I can put it this way, India has successfully walked on both sides of the street. Uh, developing relations with Japan, very strong ties with the US, at the same time having a very strong tie with Russia. And uh, India's um, you know, membership in the SCO, in uh, BRICS, uh, also Russia, India, China, trilateral. So how do you see India walking on both sides of the road or the street and not tripping? So that's my question. No, I, I think uh, what it was never both sides of the street. I think uh, there was always a tilt. Uh, India's non-alignment uh, in the past, before Cold War, was tilted to the Soviet Union. I mean, you can pretend it was non-aligned, but it was tilted to the Soviet Union. Uh, whether it's in Afghanistan, with you know, uh, Hungary or Czechoslovakia, or uh, most issues. I mean, that, and, and it's not something to be you know um, uh, embarrassed about. But that, that's a fact. Uh, you need a Russia to deal with the, initially with Anglo-American intervention in Kashmir, later the Ameri Sino-American Pakistani collaboration. So it was a balance of power structure in which India turned to the Soviet Union to balance initially the Anglo-Americans and later the Anglo-American partnership with the Chinese. Uh, so, so now uh, uh, what you're seeing is really India tilting to the United States and the West to balance the Chinese threat. So then how do you explain BRICS and SCO? Look, BRICS and SCO represent a path dependence, if you will, I mean, that the fear in the 90s was about a, about a unipolar world dominated by the US. And I lived in the US at the time, the American rhetoric on uh, you know, Kashmir diplomacy, on how human rights in Kashmir, they're going to take up and fix the Kashmir problem between India and Pakistan. Uh, they're going to force uh, India to give up its nuclear weapons and missiles. Pretty serious, and the Clinton administration in particular. That was the talk. And then in New York, uh, the whole new world order of uh, supranational sovereignty is gone. We're all going to be governed by some bunch of bureaucrats in the UN. But this was the liberal internationalist uh, delusion of the 90s. So the India's reaction to that was to join hands with Russia and China I think it was really the Russians who persuaded us, I mean, uh, to be uh, trilateral with, with the Chinese. The Chinese, too, were not enthusiastic about India, uh, because for them, they had a very good relationship with the US in the, in the 90s and the 2000s. But it seemed a sensible idea to limit the unipolarity of the US power. 
So that was the framing under which India joined BRICS. Uh, and then BRIC, uh, RIC became BRIC, and BRIC became BRICS, uh, initially Brazil, then uh, South Africa. Uh, so now, but the point is today, India's problem comes from Chinese power, not American power. The US helped India to uh, overcome the problem of uh, nuclear isolation. It is in US that pushed us into the uh, resolve the nuclear issue. Uh, US doesn't raise the Kashmir question in the UN. It is the Chinese who raise the Kashmir question in the UN. US supports India on the terrorism question. China does not. So the framing of 90s on terrorism, Pakistan, Kashmir, and nuclear, the US is in the right column today. And China is in the opposite column. And Russians are somewhere in the neutral. So the, what began as an exercise in dealing with unipolar world, that is American power, today we are looking at the dangers of a unipolar Asia which means in Asia that is not dominated by the Chinese. And the answer to that is in the Quad. So therefore, the real stuff is happening in the Quad. BRICS will produce a 50-page declaration. I mean, you can read it if you like. I mean, uh, uh, there is a BRICS bank, there is BRICS games, there is BRICS this, BRICS that. I mean, but the fact is, our prime minister doesn't even shake hands with the president of China when they're together in the same room in SEO. So I think it is, it's not where you are in a formal structure, but the, the real threat to India come from the Chinese power. I mean, someday maybe they'll be fixed. We have to fix it at some point, because China is, after all, our neighbor. Uh, but someday it'll be fixed. But at this point, Chinese power is the problem. So India is not going to walk out of the BRICS or uh, SEO. Uh, if you read the statement of the SEO, uh, how many members do they have? I mean, uh, original five, six, about eight members including Iran. See the paragraph on uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So out of the eight, they mentioned seven names, minus India. All these seven countries support the Belt and Road Initiative as a great blah, blah, blah. Which means India is supposed, India does not willing to support that, that framing. So, so I think those, uh, those differences are quite real. While the collaboration with the US to deal with American Chinese power is also real. So, so I would say go by the uh, actual thing, what is happening, while we're sitting in the BRICS and the Quad and the SEO, uh, but, but where is the movement, where is the energy, and where is uh, the, it is more of a reflection of the past rather than of the, of the future. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Ganesh Kudesia, South Asian Studies Program and ISIS. Uh, thank you very much for that very wide canvas which you have drawn. And I was hoping uh, that I could get you to comment a little bit on the China-Russia relationship mm. in, in, this, in this current scenario. That's all. Thank you. No, I'm glad uh, you asked the question because I, I didn't touch on uh, that. One of the changes that has taken place really is the that three weeks before the Ukraine invasion, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin sat and declared uh, alliance without limits uh, and um, partnership without, with no forbidden areas. Uh, so in a way, you could think, at least in retrospect, uh, that gave a certain legitimacy to uh, the uh, sense, sense of confidence to, to Putin to do what he did. Uh, and don't forget that uh, Biden tried to persuade uh, Putin in June 2021 in Geneva, look, we can build a predictable relationship, find ways of resolving the differences. But Putin clearly chose the Chinese partnership, and that, that would be valuable for him uh, in dealing with this. What is, is I mean, it's his case that Russia, the West was isolating him, West has denied its uh, respect, equality, all that uh, resentments that he had. But he chose a certain path, and the Chinese seemed open to back him. So for both of them, the hostility to the West and the idea that they can change the global order in partnership. And then they said a whole lot of geopolitical framing. So Eurasian solidarity against the Indo-Pacific uh, maritime democracies or of uh, the, the you know, East versus the West. You, you could frame it in whichever way you wanted. But the idea that, look, the, the two continental powers can come together 
to end the hegemony of the West uh, that we had seen for the last uh, 40 years. Uh, but then uh, that, that is the basis on which they went. Uh, but the fact is, say, seven months later, uh, it's not in the Russia. You know, China has not come out and explicitly supported uh, Russian invasion. They've given diplomatic support, they've given political support, but they're not given any military support. Uh, and the fact that Putin had to say, uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, we'll explain your concerns, we want to address your concerns on the... So clearly, things have not gone according to the script. Uh, whether they say, you know, they're not going to declare an end to the partnership, but the fact is today, the way things have panned out in Europe complicates uh, even Chinese calculations. Uh, the second uh, dimension to the, to the relationship is the fact that uh, for many in India had argued uh, that, look, the West is pushing Russia into Chinese arms. But my, my position is, look, Russians are not little babes in the world, you know, that they are, you know, they've been a state around for a thousand years. They, are, uh, they can do their own sums. They can do their own calculations. And there was a calculation that was made by the Russians that it is better to be with China rather than with the West. Now, once they made that calculation, this for India, it's, we are not in a position to influence that outcome. Russia has made that calculation on the base of its own interests. It's willing to protect its equities in India. India wants to protect its equities in Russia. But, but together, what they're going to do is a problem for India, that a Sino-Russian partnership makes it harder for India uh, to deal with the regional situation. And we're already seeing it in vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, where Russia backs uh, China. Well, Abesan tried very hard to build a relationship with Russia. But now, at least in Vietnam, which had a historically good relationship with Russia because of the Communist Party relationship. So what is Russia's role in the region? Is it one? of fundamentally trying to limit American power in partnership with Asia, with China, and reinforcing Chinese power in Asia, then that doesn't suit India. I mean, I think, no, Indian government is not going to say it, but, but the fact is, this is a new situation. Uh, and that, uh, to, that while Russia continues to supply arms to India, will, will sell us oil and all that stuff, but the geopolitical structure, a Russia-China partnership, uh, will make it uh, more harder for India. And, and one reason what India's response would be to strengthen its own cooperation with the West, while at the same time, see how much of engagement you can maintain with Russia uh, within the constraints. But the day the oil sanctions support, I mean, India is not going to simply risk its exposure to the West just because you want to uh, continue to engage the, uh, the Russians. So I think it produces a new constraint, uh, a Sino-Russian alliance. I mean, this was the situation in the 1950s, if you, if you go back to the 1950s. So there are other schools in Delhi which thinks that, look, Russians don't trust the Chinese. It's never really a, an alliance that will, will not work because the contradictions between them are, are very sharp. But in practice, actually, no, the contradictions with the West, quite clearly the calculation of Putin and Xi is that calculations, the contradictions with the West are far more important than the contradictions between themselves. Uh, that's what has currently prevailed. But if situation goes worse in Ukraine, then I think the Chinese will make their own calculations uh, afresh. Uh, because these are not permanent uh, relationships. These are relationships on the basis of uh, existing realities. So. Um, Yogesh? Thank you, Dr. Uh, really uh, learned a lot out of that, uh, you know, looking at the whole avenues of issues in a sense. Uh, I have just two questions. Uh, one is related to the Russia question. I think it's very important in some sense, and you, you, know, you underlined the importance of history. Uh, I think the fundamental factor in when it comes to Russia has always been the larger Asian balance of power. Uh, because the Indians from the very beginning understood that whichever way India goes, with the West, they cannot influence the Asian balance of power without Russia as an independent actor, but and hopefully as a friendly actor. Uh, and that you can see building up from late 1950s, especially after the death of Stalin, Khrushchev and Bulgarian visit India, they go to Kashmir in 1955. 
uh, but seriously since late 1950s, especially with Sino-Soviet split and India's split and all that. Uh, and this comes out very clearly when you see the documentation in the archives on joint security guarantees. So India not only asks for nuclear security guarantees, but it asks, actually asks for joint conventional guarantees in 1963 from both Soviet Union, and which has not been underlined so far. Uh, and even when the Americans are willing to give some kind of private assurances, the Indians are not taking those private insurances because they think that Soviet Union is fundamentally an important actor in Asian balance of power. Uh, and therefore, that continues over a period of time. Then we see the tilt and all that. I think that idea is still very fresh in the minds of Indian decision makers vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine crisis as well. But the point is this now, which you rightly said, you know, if the Russians actually decide which, they wanna, which, they, which way they want to go, then what is India needs to do? Uh, and that is, that is, in some sense, the most relevant question for India. Uh, so in some sense, but the most important thing over here is that if India is in a very tricky situation because no one else is a part of Eurasia. So when you have China and Russia together in this huge landmass of Eurasia, then what? How do you, as both a continental and a maritime power, take upon you know, a huge landmass of powers which may dominate Eurasia in some sense. Uh, so that was in some sense if you could reflect on that. But most importantly, Taiwan crisis, is there some thinking in India of what happens if Ukraine is re repeated in Taiwan? And whether China fails or succeeds, what would be the repercussions? And there are definite military repercussions, political, military, grand strategy-wise. Uh, and fundamentally, they would impact India at some point in time. So is there any thinking on that? No, on the first question, I mean, both the two parts to it. One is the looking back to the past and looking to the, to the future. I mean, I have somewhat unconventional view. Uh, I think in retrospect, it's good to have, easy to have six, six by six vision. But I think the India is consistently, modern India has consistently overestimated the Russian power. Uh, there's historic reasons, I mean, for that, I mean, which, which is Russia was always the weakest of the Western powers, uh, that uh, as the late industrializer, that its ability to shape, well, it was in the part of the many concerts of Europe that emerged over a period of time, but it was its late industrialization and its uh, vast backwardness till the uh, Soviet revolution happened was one which constrained its great power role. Uh, but the problem for India has been, and I think uh, it's been the rise of India's nationalism coincided with a romantic view of Soviet Union. Now, this is not saying good or bad, but that's a historic fact that as India, as the, as the fight against colonialism sharpened in the interwar period, uh, that you have actually Soviet Union's formation in 1917 happens at the same time. and. Like the United States, Soviet Union says we are for the liberation of Asia from colonial yoke. So both Lenin and the, um, Woodrow Wilson at the same time talk about a freedom of nations. I mean, of course, neither of them was fully serious, but both of them uh, you know, constrain it in, in, in different ways. Wilson can't deliver on it. Uh, uh, Lenin uh, attempted doing that. Uh, also does not succeed, but it generates the new nationalist movement uh, and the, I, the socialist ideas, the spread of Marxist ideas everywhere, all across Asia, uh, creates a, an empathy for Russia, not just among the hard-boiled communists, but across the board, uh, among the nationalist, emerging nationalist elites across Asia, Russia is a natural ally in the fight against communism. And I think that basic formula, you know, in different forms varies, but continues, for India certainly. Uh, initially as a romantic idea, as a, as a support of the East against the West, and later for us, specifically in our balance of power situation, the Russian veto on Kashmir, and later the Russian defense supplies, uh, generally justify that notion that Russia is a natural balancer for us. But if you look at even deeper historical terms, I mean, Russia's weight was never, the, though the image of superpower status, 
uh, the image of the second pole of the international system was never really fully borne out by the actual economic facts. Uh, much of it, because of the Cold War, there was a time when CIA was saying East Germany's GDP was two times that of the West Germany. But then you had to hype up the threat. But Russia was always a weak power economically. It had the nuclear weapons. It, had, it could produce tanks. But the, its ability to influence the global economy was fundamentally constrained. And the moment China broke away from Russia, turned to the West, did its industrialization without the Russian support, the Asian paradigm changed. But we were the last ones to, to change. So I think the, but the overestimation of Russia as a, as a fundamental factor, even for an India, specific Indian situation, I think is real. I'm not saying that, look, Russia as a, as a major power, it'll have some value. But to frame it as a central element of the global balance of but the, two, the symmetric situation of two superpowers, two nuclear powers, you know, managing the world after 1945, I think uh, gave a, a false impression. But on the economic side, they could never match. Because unlike China, they walked out of the global economic system, uh, or they were pushed out of the economic system. They created their own Eastern Bloc, Comecon. Uh, on. Uh, there was a time when India was in its radical phase. Some people wanted to join the Comecon with uh, Eastern Europe. But anyway, that's a, a historical note. But the fact is, Russia's weaknesses have been continuously exposed. But our dependence, then we've not made that adaptation post-91, still hoping like a, a rising Russia a, a, would always be there. But, but I think it's, you know, this crisis is going to make it even more, even if it drops a nuclear weapon, Russia is not much else. So, so I think while it's our desire to have a balancing force, would post-Putin Russia be that balancing force? Because I think here it's important to remember both Russia and China, to that matter, has a westernizing element in it. After all, you can say Khrushchev, Gorbachev, and uh, Yeltsin were westernizers within the Russian divide between Slavophiles and the westernizers. So we, we had huge problems with uh, Yeltsin's foreign policy where they didn't, they didn't care for India. They said, look, we are going to integrate with the West. So this notion that Russia would always be the bulwark against the West, I mean, that's not true. At least in recent history, we've seen that. And, and that there's no guarantee that the post-Putin Russia would actually be, uh, want to be in that position. So, so I think they will be divided. They will, there are uh, elements of Russia who want to be part of Europe want to be treated as part of the West. And they don't, it's not the fundamental mission in life uh, to produce an Asian balance of power. So I think today, uh, with the $1.6 trillion GDP, uh, the leverage that Putin had was on natural resources, on energy resources. But if you beat that out of the game, so Russia's power, I think, is really, uh, that's where the outcome of this war is going to be so crucial. The, Putin's hope that he can leverage oil and natural gas resources to beat down European resistance, uh, to undermine American sanctions. If that strategy fails, then what does Russia has to do? So it's still there are nuclear weapons, but you can't build a superpower status only on the base of uh, nuclear weapons. So I think, uh, and second, I think we have not had in India, I think, an empathy for Russian history, of Russian sensibility of their struggle to build a democracy, it's always about standing up to the West, because we don't like the West. <laughs> standing up to the West is your main objective in Russia. But they, they're another society that, that wants a relationship with the West. So I don't think we have enough empathy, though there was a time when India was so culturally linked to Russia. You know, in the communist period, we, translations of great Russian classics. But political, your political class, your foreign policy establishment has no sensibility to Russian history or of uh, Russia's own aspirations. But it is, a, it is a prop for us, but the prop is a shaky one. But on the, on the future, yes, I mean, Russia, the post-Putin Russia that will be accommodated into the West will still have a lot to offer for us. But that's on the basis of that reality, not a sentimental basis that you can build a, build a relationship with Russia. But, but I think uh, if Russia, you know, if Russia is treated like Germany, if Russia is defeated and is treated like Germany at the end of the Second World War, it will be a very different Russia that comes out. So I think that's why if you think of the scale of the conflict today and its outcomes, well, Russia is itself at a, at a very decisive point. Was it worth confronting the West for the sake of more additional territory? 
but the Putin's grand dream of reclaiming all the Russian lands, of restoring the Russian empire to its glory. I mean, I think it's a, uh, if that fails, I mean, chances look like it's not going to be easy to do that. Then uh, where does, you have to make fresh calculations, I mean, in terms of where the distribution of power is, which is the source of technology, which is the source of energy. I think everyone will make those calculations afterwards. And I think how we build a relationship will depend on that. But at this point, Russian salience is coming down because it's no longer a major economic partner. There is the question of nuclear weapons, uh, sorry, nuclear deterrent and the uh, conventional weapons. But it's not that, uh, that how that plays out, we'll, we'll see. But, but it's a, overall, it's a declining force in India's calculus. Oh, sorry. On the, look, I think there is not much debate for a short while because China is being difficult to us. We should be nice to Taiwan. I mean, that's not a, a but that's a kind of very uh, rough sentiment out there. But but I don't think the India's China hands are very cautious, as I said, in uh, in dealing with the crisis. But a crisis, if the crisis comes to blows, uh, I think the country to watch is Japan. And I think we've not paid enough attention in India to that. A Jap a, if Taiwan goes under, Japan's security will be fundamentally transformed. Uh, already you have Japanese saying Taiwan's security is Japan's security. Japan is talking about rearmament. Japan is talking about doubling its defense expenditure from $40 billion a year to $80 billion a year in, in a five-year period. Uh, then you can imagine a Japan that spends $80 billion a year annually is the third largest defense spender it'll be if, if the current uh, project goes through. They're talking about building a thousand missile arsenal. So you, you're going to talk about Japan, the third largest economy so far, largely being a minor actor in the, in the defense realm. So one of the successes of American policy in Asia has been to build up the allies and not do everything yourself. That a Japan that contributes $40 billion additionally every year to defense of Asia is far more consequential than a Japan that simply supports US positions on the, you know, in the multilateral bodies. So I think, and similarly for India, my, my sense is that the US would be happy to support a stronger India and stronger defense capabilities. So it is not, if the strategy is to do in situ balancing, and the Chinese invasion on Taiwan would actually accelerate that construction of an in situ balance of power. And you're already seeing the Korean, the Japanese debate on the nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe Dr. Jain can talk about it. Uh, there is Koreans are talking about more nuclear capabilities. So there is actually a China that takes Taiwan by force would, I think, fundamentally alter the, the calculus uh, in the region, and which will lead to a militarization of Japan's, China's periphery, which is not an outcome that Chinese would have wanted. But I think. I don't see how that can be stopped now, uh, given uh, what Japan will do, what India will do, and what South Korea will do. Uh, so we're talking about a new phase in Asia, if Taiwan really goes under a phase in which uh, the rest of Asia will begin to stand up and uh, defend itself. So that would actually increase the, the military quality of the military presence on China's periphery to the, to the around its periphery with the American support. Okay, we have time for one last question, and I had seen Karthik's hand, so. Uh, thank you so much. Um, That's great. Um, I was particularly interested in the last part of your presentation on the vocabulary. What kind of an Indian foreign policy will we see in the future, and how do we call it? What do we identify it as? How do we categorize it? And I, I want to just sort of kind of give you my view on what that will be, and then hopefully ask a couple of questions from that. Um, I mean, increasingly, how I see it is we're probably moving towards a phase where India will have a geoeconomic foreign policy, right? Where its economy, the domestic economy, becomes the organizing principle of its foreign policy, and the economy and different aspects of India's economy will be the primary instrument, the lever, the means through which different foreign policy objectives are achieved and obtained. And you kind of trace this in, in, in some areas already. We talked about trade, um, and not just choosing to sign which trade agreements with selective partners. It's also um, 
an emphasis on rules, right? And, 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 and an emphasis on creating rules that are compatible with your economy and your economic actors, with your primary trade partners, whether that's the US, the EU, or whoever. Um, so that's on the trade side. Same thing on the technology side. There's enough happening domestically that India can use, whether it's exporting digital infrastructures or using its data market as leverage uh, or using its digital trade you know, in, and how it organizes itself with other key economies and partners. Uh, on the climate side, you, know, you are increasingly seeing an emphasis on um, green and renewable energy technologies where India's capacity, its preferences, and its emphasis to create a massive solar energy and a green energy, or whether it's green hydrogen and all these related aspects, and use that as a foreign policy lever or mechanism, right? Um, so you have trade, technology, investment, climate. You know, all these aspects will become far more embedded within your own foreign policy that you can use to shape outcomes in your favor, right? And this is how I see it going forward. And as India's economy, you know, now it's fifth, but as it moves ahead, fourth, third, it'll become increasingly uh, more apparent. Uh, in that case, if what I am sketching out is a possibility, then I guess two questions come to mind. What will that mean for India's security, right? Will that mean India will um, tilt closer, partner with, um, with partners they have a deeper economic relationship with? And here I'm referring to the United States, right? Are we seeing more and more of a tilt in the next 15, 20 years towards the US than has been the case uh, in the past? And how will that affect India's security? And second is how will that affect India's own foreign policy institutions, right? How can the MEA then change quickly, fastly, adeptly enough, bringing in expertise from all these different areas, uh, bringing in people who understand the strategic aspects of climate, the strategic aspects of data, AI, uh, and other technological and investment aspects, can India's own foreign policy institutions, the MEA, um, you know, advance this geoeconomic foreign policy in the next 15, 20, 30 years? Right. I think we should organize a whole this seminar on that. I mean, no, but I think my, you know, every one of the things you said is, it reflects a dimension of what's going on uh, in India's engagement with the world. But in the end, in my view, that geoeconomics is a condition. It's not a, it can't be your quality of your foreign, you know, descriptor of your foreign policy. The primacy of economics never really disappeared. I mean, in a way that it is not something that has come, that in a globalized world that we saw that's, but, but you know, India's relationship, with, you go back to the socialist era, I mean, India's, it, it was geoeconomics in a way, right? I mean, that once you say, look, import substitution, I don't uh, like foreign capital, I, I no, Soviet Union was helping India build its steel plants and uh, etc. So it looked fairly. So it's not that the economics and politics were separated. I mean that they were actually closely, closely linked. So while the question of new forces of production, new technologies, uh, you know, ex new externalities like climate, uh, are all real. Now they all the new conditions to which India has to respond is responding. I mean whether it is there is no escaping that right. Whether you do it well, do it badly. There is a continuous adaptation, like on climate, from saying, look, it's not our problem, to be saying it's, we want to be part of the answer. On, on technologies, you're leveraging what capabilities that you have. But in the end, still, what is the theory? I mean, if you're looking at what is its case for its role in the world? Like, if we go back to the US, 1776, in the beginning, they said, look, we are non-aligned. We don't want to be aligned with the old world. Uh, we don't want to get into entangling alliances, which is what George Washington said. But today, that's not what the U.S. says today. Right? Uh, that it says, look, where there's democracy promotion, whether it is one of leadership, we're not there in the debate. You know, that leadership issue comes as a leader of the global south. But do you have an idea of how to organize the world? In some senses, in the 50s, you had, which is uh, probably, you can say, wrong ideas. But, but you had ideas in terms of we will bring the third world together, we will change the, you know, we'll build a new world order. But today, what is that larger role where all these factors you mentioned, economics, uh, technology, uh, 
your institutional capacity? How do you bring them? What is to what end? To what purpose? The domestic side of it is easy, you know, to produce prosperity to your people. That you should never forget. Like that's the fundamental goal, uh, to lift up Indian people uh, to a to a greater level of prosperity and uh, and uh, and uh, security internally. But externally, what is the what is the case? There is no case in a sense. You have to make a case of how do you reorganize the world. It's not that it'll always work. It's good to be like Anglo-Saxons or Brits and simply work along, or be Germanic and say, look, I've got this grand theory, which kind of can go terribly wrong. Uh, so what is it that uh, we are trying to do? I mean, you can sum, you can infer that, one, you want a greater say in the outcomes of international rule setting, of international institution building, uh, whether it is creating new institutions like Solar Alliance or but you would want a better shape, your capacity to shape the global order, right? And they, on everything from technology to security to that, I think, as you get to the third largest economy, in some senses, your capacities, those capacities will come. But then how do you use it? I mean, what are the principles on which you use that, your growing power, and to what end? Those debates, I think, we've not had those debates. I think, I think that's where, Again, I think it's largely up to us to, to really make pose those questions. But there's so much focus is on non-alignment strategic autonomy still, not saying, look, to what extent, to what end. Uh, see, there's one lot which constantly stand up to the West. Let's go, do the global south. But in the end, how do you, there's still a world in which you want to structure the world in, in a particular format. See, on climate change, you can keep saying common but differentiated responsibility, but what is your goal? I mean, are you really for significant elimination of carbon production? If that is a long-term goal, how do we get there? I mean, so there you can differ in terms of the strategy, but that larger goals for reorganizing the world with your growing capabilities, I think that debate uh, is, is I, I think it's, it's um, I don't know if it's work in progress, or it's uh, work yet to be begun, I think, but, but that's where I think we need to have spend more time uh, beyond the daily stuff that goes on on the crisis that, that uh, the structure of even, for example, I mean, you had great ideas about Asian security, whatever, you need to go back to the interwar period, all of Asia will come together to throw out the West, but that's not working. So, so now, if you want to, you, eventually you need a, a framework to live with China. What would be the nature of the order you want to build in the region? What would be the nature of the trading arrangements? Uh, who would secure the ship, shipping lanes? I think all those ideas uh, will still need to be debated, which is where I think next decade, as India doubles its economy from three to six, seven, um, those are the questions I think we need to we need to engage with. But I think what you raised, I mean, all those become very very critical for uh, for the next uh, in India a decade later. What does it do? Thank you. I I'm sure this uh, discussion could have gone on and on, but due to time constraints, I have to call the uh, formal proceedings to a close. I'm sure we can take up the questions um, after this formal close of this. Professor Rajamohan, as usual, you have left us with um, a very rich analysis of developments that are unfolding, but also questions about how we should think about the future of Indian foreign policy, but also the global order as it's shaping itself. And I thank you for that. It's lovely to have you back in the room no. here, but thank it's uh, and thank you for the talk. So please join me in thanking uh, Professor Raja Mohan. Thanks. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today.